Good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us for the webinar this evening, which has been hosted by HDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Chloe McKee, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb. And tonight we'll be discussing how to optimise mature weight of cattle and sheep for farm efficiency. <coughs> Our presenters this evening are Kim Matthews, Head of Animal Breeding and Product Quality at HDB, and Tim Byron, Managing Director, and Tom Kirk, Consultant, both from Abacus Bio International Limited. So the plan of action for tonight is that Kim will give a brief introduction to the project and then Tim and Tom will take us through a 30 minute presentation. You'll all be muted throughout the webinar, but if you'd like to ask a question, then please type it into the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. If you can't see this box, you may need to click on the orange arrow to open up your control panel. Click on the questions grey box and the little arrow on the drop down. And do please also use this box if you're having any technical difficulties and we'll do our best to help you. So fingers crossed there won't be any problems tonight, but please bear with us if there are any. Uh, so Kim, I'll hand over to you to begin this evening's webinar. Yes, thanks, Chloe. So um, this project was set up to look at the question of optimum size of cows and, and ewes, uh, really in commercial herds and flocks, as determined by their genetics. And, and as Chloe said, it's, uh, it was undertaken by Abacus Bio, and Tim Byrne and Tom Kirk from Abacus will be, be presenting shortly. Uh, before I hand over to, to Tom, um, just a bit of introduction from me. So the work was funded in collaboration between AHDB, HCC Meat Promotion Wales and Quality Meat Scotland from our Ring Fenced Fund, which was established as an interim measure while the issue of levy redistribution is agreed. So uh, why this project? Well, bigger cows and ewes generally produce larger calves and lambs, which is a good thing in some cases, and breeding for increased growth, which is obviously a good thing, increased growth rate, has tended to increase the larger uh, mature sizes. But on the other hand, those larger animals in the breeding herd or flock can cost more money through higher maintenance, uh, they eat more, and therefore they have to be stocked perhaps at a lower density. And then on top of that, we have the, the issue of processes implementing increasingly tight weight limits on slaughter animals. So the project was really undertaken to look at the implications of those differences in breeding female mature weight as determined by their genetics, based on how those changes in mature weight impact the other traits like uh, like the costs and the revenues that will be generated in the farm system. So uh, over to Tom, who's going to give us a bit more detail of, of what we will cover and explain the work uh, from a more, perhaps a more technical perspective. Tom. Thank, thanks for that introduction, Kim. Um, and also thank you everybody for, for tuning in this evening. Um, I'm very happy to be talking to all of you. Um, so I guess, first of all, just an overview of, of what this presentation is going to look like. So um, I'm going to go a little bit into the just the project background. And then I'm going to start and then I'm going to talk about what the modelling process involved and specifically some of those questions that we're going to look at and try to answer uh, investigating how does mature weight affect reproduction and how does mature weight affect progeny performance for sheep and beef farms and ultimately those are going to be two of the major things which affect what what is I guess the optimum mature weight um, and so as we kind of look in and learn at those things after that we're going to look at the results and figure out what 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 does an optimum mature weight look like and then take out of that some key messages um, which will hopefully help you on farm and then we're going to have some question time. So for, for a bit of project background, um, in addition to what Kim has already said, is if we look back over the last kind of 30 or 40 or 50 years even, over at, at mature weight of breeding females, um, and here these charts use carcass weight as a, a proxy for that mature weight, we can see that ewes have more or less remained the same weight since around 1980 whereas on the other hand cows have been getting significantly heavier, heavier um, since the 70s if you're wondering what that dip is there in the chart that i think is due to uh, mad cow disease um, 
And some of the reasons why cows have been getting heavier is because heavier breeds are becoming more common. But also on the other hand, there's been a preference for heavier cows because of the belief that they're gonna produce heavier, faster growing progeny. And so that's kind of the context which we decided to, to undertake this project. And the aim of this is to understand the financial impact of increasing mature weight uh, over time and how that affects the finances on farm. So we had an approach to this which was quite broad. Um, what we did is we built farm models and the aim was to conduct kind of a, a high level analysis of what a so-called average farm might look like and use that to understand what the effects of changing mature weight are. So how we, how we conducted this and how we built the, the supposed average farm was we built a farm with 100 breeding females and then on that farm we calculate the revenue and the cost across a range of mature weights. Using that revenue and cost we calculate the margin over feed which is all the revenue from carcasses so from progeny and from cull, cull females and then with the feed cost associated with growing and main, growing the animals and maintaining the herd. And so that margin over feed is something of a proxy for profit, but what it doesn't consider is labor, capital, depreciation, those sort of expenses. Um, so we use margin over feed as a, is what we're trying to optimize in this setup. So before we start, there are two key concepts we want to highlight. Now, the first is that we adjust our results for fixed farm resources, which is what we call rescaling. Um, and essentially just what that means is that if we have uh, smaller females on the same amount of land, then you would increase the stocking rate. And so that just means that if they're smaller, you have more animals on your fixed farm size. And we've accounted for that. And the second key concept to highlight is that uh, heavy immature weights require higher quality feed to be purchased onto the farm. And the reason for that is if you have a fixed farm size and a fixed amount of land, there's a fixed amount of pasture, which is grass, which is cheap. But as you're getting bigger animals and you need to buy more feed, you're going to have to purchase in silage and concentrate, etc., to meet that increased demand for feed. And so this is a this is a gradual thing. Um, and that applies the heavier, rather the more expensive feed applies for mature weights for cows that are greater than 700 kilo. And for ewes, it's when they are greater than 75 kilos. So just to give you some background on what we kind of took as a representative average sheep farm, we have a ewe mature weight of 70 kilos and we test that mature weight range from 70 from 45 to 80 kilos. There's a lambing rate of 1.8 lambs burn, born per, per ewe. And we finish lambs at 19.4 kilos carcass weight. And so how we've captured differences between singles, twins and triplets is we assume that the twins and triplets are born a little bit smaller. So they take a little bit longer to grow to reach that carcass weight. And as you can see, if you look at the diet on the side there, um, they're given a little bit of extra supplementation of concentrate um, after they come off of the, after they wean. Now, if we look at the equivalent chart for a beef farm, we have an average cow mature weight of 650 kilos. And then we've gone and tested that across a range from 500 to 900 kilos. Uh, now the three types of animals which are finished on this so-called average farm, we have bulls at 330 kilo carcass weight which are finished earlier, faster, uh, at 15 months and you can see that their diet reflects the faster finishing. And then we have hares and steffers which are finished on a um, seasonal diet and finish at 24 months. So I guess the first and most important question to ask are what are the 
implications of increasing breeding female mature weight. Um, and so if we look at that, we've, there are positive and negative effects, but we've split that up here in this diagram into direct and indirect effects. Now, the direct effects, I think, are quite straightforward. So these are the ones which affect the ewe or the cow. And so these are maintenance feed costs. So a heavier, a heavier female requires more feed each year just to kind of keep, keep her going. You have increased carcass revenue. So when you get, when she reaches the end of her life and is cold, um, a heavier animal is going to earn more revenue for that meat. And third, you have a cost to grow a replacement. So growing that replacement female from the age of a, a, a lamb or a ewe or a heifer rather, up to being a mature female, um, if they're bigger, they require more feed. And so that's a negative cost. Now, on the other side, we have indirect effects, and what these capture is how the female mature weight affects the progeny. Now, the first two effects are, um, are related to reproduction. And so, first of all, there is fecundity. Now, heavier ewes produce more lambs. In cows, there's the opposite effect. We see heavier cows produce fewer calves. And I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail in a second. And then the other effects are the carcass weight and quality. So you have faster growing animals may have more feed, or sorry, heavier animals may have more feed costs, even though they also have more carcass revenue. But then you have issues with carcass weight penalties, depending on processes and question of how does a fast or a slow and growing animal affect conformation and fat. And so again, we're gonna look into the carcass weight and quality effects in a little bit more detail in a second. So the first question is, uh, how does mature weight affect fecundity for ewes? And the answer is that a heavier ewe has a greater chance of birthing twins or triplets because it increases the ovulation rate. And so overall, that means you have more lambs born on farm for heavier mature weights. Um, it's important to note this effect is shows diminishing returns. So if, you're, if your ewes are very small and they gain five kilos, you're going to have a, an increase in your lambing rate. But if your ewes are 70 kilos, and they keep getting heavier, you're not going to see that, that increase in um, number of lambs born. So now we ask the same question, but for cattle, and the answer is the opposite way. And so a heavier cow is associated with a lower conception rate at the second calving. And why is that? It's because the cow is less likely to meet its target weight at its second mating due to increased feed requirements. Now, as you, as you can see in that chart there, the blue line represents the conception rate at the second calving. And so after 700 kilos, we can see that that starts going down from around 90%. Now, as a result of that lower conception rate from second calving, it also means that cows which don't get pregnant at this point are more likely to get cold and therefore that reduces the survival rate between ages two to three. Um, and that kind of is, is the orange line there and goes down um, in unison with the lower conception rate as we increase mature weight. And so that kind of has a, a double effect. First, you have fewer calves born. And second, you have a slightly increasing replacement cost because of that increasing cull. And now we're going to look at how does mature weight affect offspring? And this is kind of the key question that I think a lot of people uh, want to know the answer to. Um, and of course, heavier ewes result in faster growing lambs. In our model, we've done this. Um, faster growing lambs are slaughtered earlier. Uh, this is done because most sheep farmers don't finish their lambs heavier. They tend to aim for a constant weight. And so what happens when you have earlier slaughter? 
it means that you have lower feed costs because your animals are on the farm for less time, eating less. But it also means you have a less fat and less confirmation score. Now, if we take a closer look at this chart on the right hand side, there's carcass revenue and there's the age at slaughter and somewhere in the middle is an optimum. And what we see, um, it's the same across singles, twins and triplets, is if we reduce the age at slaughter, then we have a lower carcass, carcass revenue. And that's because we have less fat, but also lower confirmation. And therefore, faster finished animals tend to have worse confirmation, which is reflected in a slightly lower price per kilogram of meat. Now, that's not a huge effect. You can see there's only about one pound between the um, top and bottom of the, each of those curves, but it's an effect nonetheless. And they can add up. So now if we ask the same question, how does mature weight affect offspring? If we ask this for, um, for beef farmers, well, a heavier cow still produces faster growing calves, but faster growing calves mean beef farmers have to choose uh, one of two options. And these are illustrated on the diagram there. So the first option is you can take heavier slaughter, which means you, the animal grows to the same age but because it's growing faster, it's heavier at the time of slaughter. Or you can do the opposite and you can slaughter an animal at the same cons the same weight as it normally would be, but you slaughter it earlier and therefore it's on the on farm this time. So this chart here reflects what happens if we have a fast growing animal and we choose to slaughter at a constant age. It means that there's a bigger carcass and there's more revenue. And what that reflects there is, as you can see, uh, the revenue associated with the uh, different carcass weights. At the top, however, uh, we see that this revenue starts to plateau after we reach about 400, 420 kilograms. And the reason that we have this plateau is because processors don't want to pay for carcasses which are too heavy. And so, additional meat over a certain threshold doesn't necessarily earn any more revenue. And so while we can look at this, uh, look at this chart and see heavier carcasses are having heavier revenue, we also have to remember that there's increased feed costs associated with this, which we're gonna bring in later. Now, the opposite strategy we can take with heavier cows uh, and faster growing calves is the same thing we did with lambs, and that is we can go for early slaughter at a constant carcass weight. And the result of that is that faster finished animals tend to have both less conformation and less fat. But if they say weigh the same weight, overall there's not a lot of variation in that carcass revenue. So you might get a slightly lower effect per kilogram, but it's still the same amount of kilogram, or the same weight rather. Now, Tim's going to take over here, I think. I am. Thank you, Tom. So this um, this graph is the results for sheep, and you can see that along the bottom axis is the breeding female mature weight, and it ranges from 45 to, um, to 80, as Tom mentioned. And on the vertical axis, we've got um, Costs and revenue. So the some of those lines on the graph represent revenues and some represent costs. So the very top line, the grey line there, is the carcass revenue, and you can see that at low mature weights, that line um, increases, and then later on, at around 65 kilos, it sort of plateaus off. And so that early increase in revenue from carcasses comes from primarily more lambs in the early. Um, at, at lower carcass weight. So you remember that graph from Tom, which showed increased fecundity at when when mature weights are lower. So that's driving the increase in revenue. Not a lot of that increase in revenue is due to 
uh, extra confirmation and fat, um, and that's because, as Tom mentioned, as you actually grow these lambs faster and kill them earlier, they're actually slightly less mature when they're finished, and so you get less confirmation of fat. So that's actually dragging a little bit of revenue out of that grey line. Uh, down the bottom, we've got the feed cost, and you can see that as you increase mature weight, that line is trending downwards, which shows an increase in costs. And then, and then at around 75 kilos, there's a, a significant drop in that um, in that orange line showing an increase in feed costs associated with that higher cost, higher input feed uh, for heavier use. So what do, we, what do we get as a message out of this? Well, we get um, an optimum around 55 kilos, which is a pretty small U, but the, the, the range is very wide. So that dark blue line is quite flat across most of the mature weight ranges, most of the mature weights that we model. And the light blue line just under it there is the is the re-optimized um, is the sorry the rescaled effect so adjusting for stocking rate and you can see that it doesn't change the story hugely. Um, so we have a story for sheep that is basically a, a pretty wide ranging optimum, and that is because, and again you'll remember the the picture from Tom. Actually, most of the um, most of the effects of increasing mature weight are through a small increase in carcass revenue. The, the range is about a pound across the whole carcass from the lowest confirmation and fat score up to the best. And so we're not seeing a huge amount of change in revenue and that change in revenue is more or less offset by increases in feed costs. And so we end up with a pretty flat line. Next slide, please, Tom. Now shifting on to beef and looking at the optimum when the progeny are finished at a constant age. So this is when those faster growing progeny are carried through to a heavier carcass weight. So the lines are the same. We've got that gray line at the top, which is carcass revenue. And you can see that when you kill at a constant age, we get a steady increase in revenue uh, from those heavier progeny carcasses and, and, and obviously heavier uh, mature cow, cow cow carcasses um, and that holds up to about 710 or 720 kilos uh, for for the cow and what happens is at 720 kilos for the cow the progeny carcasses start to come up against that uh, processor penalty and so we see as a, a definite plateau there of the carcass revenue line because you you grow these um, progeny for for longer until the, uh, for longer until they're well you, sorry you grow them to the same age until they're heavier and you don't get any more money for that. We've then got the feed cost line and you can see that steadily declines, indicating an increase in costs. You can see that little kick again at around 700 kilos where the extra feed, the extra uh, the high quality extra cost feed kicks in for for those cows. Um, so unlike the sheep, we have a pretty narrow range here for the optimum. It's, it's 690 kilos and there's only a very small effect of rescaling. So we rescale based on the grass availability and that actually shifts the line a little bit, but not, not in a meaningful way. Um, and you can see the point there I've already made that, you know, increasing feed costs they really they really kick in after 700 kilos and we get that strong plateau in, in carcass revenue which is definitely contributing to that optimum. Next slide please Tom. So interestingly the story for beef when carcasses are finished at a constant carcass weight so this is where the fast grown progeny are assumed to be killed earlier rather than heavier so they're killed earlier earlier at the same carcass weight rather than heavier. So we've got that revenue uh, line again, it's, it's in grey. Um, you can see that it drifts down ever so slightly across the, the mature weight range for cows. And that is because as you increase cow mature weight, you're increasing the age at which progeny mature. So they grow faster and you, can, you kill them increasingly earlier at an earlier point um, in their maturity and so you lose a little bit of confirmation and fat and that's why that revenue line drifts down ever so slightly. 
Uh, interestingly, the the cost line associated with feed, you can see it actually for a period up to about that optimum of 690 kilos, actually feed costs are reducing, and that's because you're continuing to increase, uh, you're continuing to kill progeny earlier and earlier. So they're costing you actually uh, less relative to to a smaller cow carcass weight. But then at that optimum, the 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 story changes and um, the extra cow feed costs and replacement costs actually offset some of the the reduction in progeny feed costs by killing them earlier. And we and that optimum r remains around around 690. Next slide, please, Tom. So if we kind of capture the key messages from from those three um, graphs showing the optimum for sheep and two versions of the optimum for beef, depending on when. Uh, when animals are slaughtered, uh, it's pretty clear, you know, that that we've modelled a you know an average farm here based on um, kind of best practice feeding, I suppose. And by no means are we saying that you have to aim to to the optimum of 690 for beef cattle and and um, 65 kilos for ewes. But what we're saying is that you know there is a range there and and some things have an impact on what the optimum will be on your farm system. So more expensive feed is obviously going to reduce the optimum. Um, if with a limited resource of pasture, we can do some rescaling based on, on on pasture availability, but any increases in mature weight are going to actually require purchased in feed and it's expensive. And so that will reduce the, the optimum. Of course, the opposite is also true. If, if you can maintain cows, um, with plenty of cheap available feed, then that will that will increase the optimum. And Tom mentioned it, and it's it's a, a really powerful point in this is that for beef, those those lower thresholds or you know bigger penalties on overweight carcasses um, actually have a huge impact on the optimum. So if meat processors bring those um, those penalties down to say 400 or even into the 300 kilo carcass weight range. Then that will that will actually um, shift the optimum mature weight to a lower point, especially if your slaughtering strategy is is at a constant age rather than killing them earlier if they grow faster. And for sheep, uh, fecundity is really important. So if you've got very small ewes, then increasing their weight will lift lift their reproductive output, but uh, the the effect is actually um, minimal as as mature weights uh, get above sort of 55 or 60 kilos, it's at that really low mature weight range. So there's some key um, drivers of the story here, and then I'm going to pass over to Kim now, who's going to talk through um, kind of the take-home messages from this and and what tools might be available. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tom and and Tim. Uh, interesting results. So, you know, as you were just saying, there's clearly no perfect size that's going to suit every system, but it does seem likely that mature sizes have probably got larger than optimum in, in many cases. So I suppose the question is, what, what should we be doing to address this, this concern? So if you're a breeder, or if you're running genetic evaluations for breeders, then consider mature size in your, in your breeding programme weigh animals, record that, that weight and use the mature size EBVs in, in your decisions and include it in any selection index that you're using and account for the costs of the bigger animals as well as the increase in value of the carcass. Um, if you're a commercial farmer or, or running a commercial beef herd or new flock, the key message is probably to look at what size suits your system and to select stock to, to target that size. And the main main difference that I've picked up from what, what uh, Tim was just saying is that the difference between farms is going to be about the availability of forage to maintain the intake of those heavier cows without having to buy in any feed. So use EBVs again in your breeding decisions and in your decision in your discussions with breeders. Use an index to select stock just to, to include mature size in the selection criteria and, and maintain that that herd or flock using maternal genetics for your replacement females uh, but keep to and keep size under control but think about perhaps using terminal genetics to to give you hybrid vigor and growth and carcass traits in the slaughter generation 
And for both, I think the key thing would be to communicate between the breeders and the commercial farmers about what are the requirements that suit the system and the attributes of the breeding stock you need uh, to ensure that the commercial farmer has the animals that they need. Well, hopefully that's a, a few helpful pointers, but I'm sure you've uh, all got some ideas of your own. So, Chloe, have we had any questions? Thanks all. Uh, yes, we have got some questions. Um, I'd just like to remind you all that the presentation has been recorded, so it will be available on the Beef and Lamb YouTube channels. Um, so the first question, just want to clarify, um, on a slide earlier, we mentioned that the optimum size of use was 55 kilos. And then in the uh, conclusion, I think 65 was mentioned. So could we just clarify what was the optimum mature size for use, please? I think it had an op plus or minus five kilos was in that range. Thank you. Uh, so, so the next is, question is... Sorry, Chloe, just saying, so it is it is 55, but there's a very broad range there. So it depends on your system, I suppose, is the, the answer. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, in use, is the difference in output from a faster growing lamb giving a lower confirmation offset by reduced costs? Uh, Tom, you're probably best to ask, answer that unless you want me to. Um, so I think the answer was yes, it is. So a faster growing lamb finished at the same weight. Um, you get lower confirmation and a slightly lower price, but that is that is quite marginal. So you might get 79 pounds for a, for a 19 kilo lamb that's finished at 200 days, but if you finish it a month earlier, you might only lose one or two pounds because of uh, worse confirmation. But the feed costs, on the other hand, will be much more than that. So I'd say the answer is yes. The faster growing lamb, um, the feed cost savings outweigh any sort of small change in um, confirmation or price. Thank you. Uh, next question is, is there, a report, is there a report available with the supporting citations for some of the assumptions that you've made tonight? Yeah, so the report is on the AHDB uh, website. Uh, so yeah, that should be freely available. Thanks, Kim. And the next question is, for a composite high fecundity U, is increased body weight still important or is body condition score more important? I would hmm. say, well, body condition score and body weight are hmm. highly correlated. So. If you add um, condition, obviously that adds weight, but I would say that uh, um, build, uh, selecting for heavier mature size in uh, already highly fecund uh, composite would be of significantly less value than managing their condition. So probably the best thing to do, and you know we've seen examples of highly fecund, um, you know, big sheep that, that actually need a huge amount of input. So you, I would imagine you wouldn't want them to be any bigger at all, and just focus on keeping them in good condition. It's probably important to, to emphasize at this point, again, that we are talking about managing mature size through genetics. So whatever mature size you have on your farm, we're not saying uh, hold back that mature size by reducing condition which will obviously have an, have an adverse effect. We're talking about the long-term direction of mature size through breeding. Good point. Thank you. And the next question is, given pasture growth can be variable, how do you think this might impact on optimal mature weight? That's a good question. Um, I would suggest the, the more variable the pasture growth rate is, the the more risk there is of not being able to feed big animals so you so i would say that uh, you know you may be looking through a climate change lens or something like that if you're not confident in your pasture supply and you've got massive 
breeding females, then that will that will mean that having smaller ones is probably better. Because if you're caught with low feed supply from grass, then you're buying in feed to look after those big animals and that's going to be expensive. Thank you. And the next question is, is 55 kilos for use, um, was that weaned weight or scanning weight? That's a good so question. You, yeah, Tom, have you got an answer to that? Uh, so I think we looked at um, across sort of the average mature weight across the year. So uh, I think it would be scanned weight or closer to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess we didn't really distinguish. Um, we just said, okay, if a ewe is 55 kilos across her lifetime, what, what would she what would she need in terms of feed inputs and what would she produce? Yeah, so for the model, it's her average weight, isn't it? For her. Correct. And it would obviously vary across the year, but mm. in fact, yeah, I mean, if if you if, if 55 is the optimum, you know, if if you actually shift up and down the line, that actually is representative of you know a fluctuation in weight. So if she happened to be 60 at scanning and that's the weight you want to use, then you could just go to that point on the graph and the results would be um, you know, applicable, bearing in mind that you know we have modeled a system that looks like a certain system. And if it's not yours exactly, then you have to be careful about interpreting the results for your farm per se. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what about high EBV bulls for confirmation, finishing steers and heifers at 15 to 16 months? Yeah, so I, I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I, I mean, I guess it's important to think about all the EBVs when you're, um, when you're breeding for your replacements, but also, again, think about those high EBVs all those carcass traits, particularly in, in the bull that you're using just to produce the slaughter generation. So I'm not quite sure if the question is asking about the uh, slaughter progeny or breeding replacements, but um, I would say those characteristics are more important when you're looking at the, the, the terminal cross. Thanks, Kim. Uh, the next question is, would residual feed intake help determine the efficiency of cows and use rather than the mature size as a better RFI could perform better even though it's a larger animal? Yeah, so RFI is really useful. Um, it's, it's a good way of assessing the efficiency of the animal um, independent of its size really. So it says, okay, if the animal's growing this fast and it's this big, is it eating more or less than we would expect? Most of the estimates of feed efficiency are on growing animals. And most of them are on growing animals not fed, you know, fed uh, in, a, in a barn on kind of um, concentrate type inputs rather than grass. So RFI certainly offers solutions, but there are some limitations in terms of where the data comes from to inform the breeding value and how applicable that is to, to adult cows. Um, but there is a relationship between RFI and young animals and, and cows. So selecting for RFI and growing stock, uh, and uh, you know, if, if you're selecting a bull that has RFI breeding values for, for growing animals, then there'll be some of that residual feed intake, some of that efficiency will be passed on to the daughters. And they'll and uh, they'll they'll express some of that as cows. Um, so yeah, it's useful, but there are some complications of actually getting it into a breeding program for females for breeding females. Yeah. So so Tim, our um, work in beef is as you say on growing animals, but we are using a mixed diet, so it's at least fifty percent forage in the diet, but it is fed in a, inside. Um, I suppose the the other question I would have for you based on what you were just said is uh, uh, it's not measuring the same thing as mature size is it so you can get benefits in efficiency from both both optimizing the mature size but then even within that mature size there will be some that are more efficient and some that are less efficient and so it's an additive benefit rather than an either or perhaps yeah. correct correct 
So if you if you take the uh, definition residual feed intake, that is uh, how much the animal eats compared to what you would expect given its weight. So it's like saying it's a, it's kind of a feed intake estimate independent of how heavy it is. Mm -hmm. So the additive exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, we've got a comment here, realistically getting a cow down from 750 kilos mature weight through genetics, and they'd like to know how long, you know, will this take to get replacements at the ideal weight? <laughs> it's a good question as well. Um, so it all comes down to the selection of the bull you use. Uh, you obviously don't want to throw out the cows you've got and truck in a whole new herd, uh, but um, if you go and pick a bull uh, that has favourable, a favourable combination of early growth and mature size breeding values, say, and, and is the right type of bull to produce females that will suit your farm, uh, then obviously it's going to take the best part of three years before you've got the first uh, raft of daughters calving. So you've got three years to wait until you get any of the daughters of that bull in the herd. And then you've got uh, however long it takes for for the daughters of that bull and the bulls to follow to replace your herd. So it's probably it's probably six or it's pro it could be ten years before you can actually replace the herd with with cows from a from a bull that has a lower mature weight. Depending on how long you keep your cows for and how high your replacement rate is, but I would say ten years. Thank you. And would we say that would be the same for sheep? Uh, no. Um, so sheep don't live as long. So um, if you buy a ram, then you have the daughters, depending on whether you're mating, um, whether you're lambing down at one year old or two or whatever, then uh, you might you might only take two years to get the daughters in, and then ewes only live for four or five years probably after their first lambing. So you might have the flock replaced in six or seven years. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, um, is the average reference weight at a particular condition score, e.g. an expected mature weight at a condition score of three or higher? Uh, so, <laughs> Um, you can well, well. So basically, what we've used is we've used metabolic mature weight as the definition, and so that is basically uh, we only count the maintenance cost. So it would be like saying, uh, what would it cost to maintain the machinery of the cow, independent of her fatness? So she could be as fat. Fat fat is actually very cheap to maintain. It's very expensive to put on and take off particularly expensive to put on but once it's on there you, it, there's no maintenance cost to it what we're talking about is what's called metabolic body weight which is basically the energy requirements to run the machine so keep the muscles working keep the gut going and and whatnot so it's actually a slightly different measure i guess we would assume that these animals you know are in a um probably a three yeah if you have one to five scale then three you know an average body condition score Part of actually part of the reason we part of the part of the data set we use to inform why two year olds would have a lower reproductive rate at higher mature weights is is to do with the relationship between condition score and um, maiden heifer calving rates because uh, if you're growing maiden heifers to a heavy and mature weight it's quite hard to get them in calving type condition to calve down at two years old. So that was the data used for that, but generally we just use metabolic mature weight, which is independent of fatness. Thank you. Uh, and the next question is, have you found that reducing age of calving reduces the eventual mature weight of the cow? Um, yeah, wow. so, well, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, literature would suggest that if you, um, Carve down your heifers at two year old, uh, and depending on the feed resources available for them, that can 
have an impact on what mature size they reach. Uh, however, um, we obviously don't recommend that as a strategy. You know, we don't recommend stunting your heifers uh, so that they don't grow out to their full mature weight as a strategy to get mature weight down. You're better off to do it through breeding. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, for suckler cattle, is the declining revenue of larger carcasses reflected for those who aren't breeder finishers, i.e. selling weaned calves or stores? So could you repeat that, sorry? Um, for suckler cattle, is the declining revenue of larger carcasses reflected for those who aren't breeder finishers, i.e. selling weaned calves or stores? I suppose, Tom, the model was really a whole system model, so it, it didn't didn't take account of those changes of ownership through through the production cycle. It would it would have looked at the whole cycle of co the whole cost through the cycle from birth to slaughter. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think that's true, Kim. Um, so you could probably it would probably depend on a case by case basis. Maybe you could say. Um, if somebody's finishing late, that might be ref that might be reflected in the price that they're getting for the animals they sell they're selling, um, because of yeah. the demand for that. But yeah, I think um, I guess if, if if someone is producing stores from large cows and those stores have a high value, it it may. It may be possible that a large for that system, a larger mature size is cost effective for that store producer, which probably means that the person buying the stores is then not going to make any money on them. But there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if anything, that particular farmer won't come up against the risk of having you know overweight carcasses that'll be someone else's problem but we would have to um i mean if the, the you know the model would suggest that at weaning or whenever they were sold you know they would be heavier and potentially of more value it would depend on whether whether the extra revenue for for the sale at for a sale at seven months or weaning age or whatever was enough to offset the cost of carrying the cow and we we can't answer that specifically but there would be Less risk of, you know, that you wouldn't come up against that problem of overweight carcasses, obviously, that would be passed on. Thank you. Um, and the next question is on a high stocking rotational grazing system where the grass is the focus of the farm system, would having lower mature weights improve outputs as more stock could be kept on the same amount of land? So, in my interpretation, that's exactly what. Um, <clears throat> what was described as rescaling, that's what that tries to account for, is the, that extra ability to stock with the lower mature size. Yeah, yeah. that's right, Kim. So smaller animals, you'd be able to take more of them on that, on that farm. Um, and if you've got abundant um, grass, um, but then, then there is the trade-off um, in that, you maybe have slower growing animals. Um, so the rescaling didn't do that much um, to the overall mature weight. Yeah, yeah. That's that's because a relatively small proportion of the feed intake was actually driven by grass. So when we rescaled, we weren't actually we weren't actually excuse me, we weren't actually adding that many additional females as mature weight went down. I guess we I guess we can't we excuse me, we can't really answer that specific question about a I mean that's a different system. That's a more intense mm. rotational grazing system. I mean we could if it was all grass, we could, you know, we would have to set up something to say the diet is entirely grass and rescale accordingly and it would be a different story, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, we have reached the last question, unless we get any in the next couple of seconds. Um, so the last one is, when will the National Terminal Sire Evaluation be able to cope with mature weight input for males? So this person says, currently my understanding is it only takes female weights. 
with rams representing 50% of the flock, selecting replacement females using mature size seems to be only telling part of the story as the male impact seems to have been missed? Oh, that's an interesting question and that's probably one for me to uh, to take away. I mean, I, I guess ultimately the um, mature size of that rams, um, any sisters that he has or any progeny that are um, that are females uh, in the in the ewe flock will feature in in the EBVs, but uh, yeah, the the question of when his own mature weight can can be put in, uh, I think, is one for me to take away and think about with colleagues. No chip in the um, yeah, sure. Um, if you're thinking about, you know, the uh, estimating the genetic merit of an individual ram and that you're going to use for breeding, his own weight is is probably well, it is actually it's a much it's a much poorer estimate of his genetic merit for weight than is, um, you know, heaps of his sisters and daughters and whatnot who actually end up in the flock. So. Um, I, I, I'll be honest. I don't. I don't actually think there's much value in putting ram weights, adult ram weights, into the genetic evaluation because there'll be so few of them. Uh, the males, the males will be weighed at a young age, so males will be weighed at weaning and scanning, and the weight of those young males at that age is quite a good predictor of the adult weight. So the male weights do go in to predict mature size. It's just that actually weighing adult males is not of much value. There's not that many of them around. And there's usually way more sisters and aunties and whatnot of that individual ram that contribute to its genetic merit rather than the weight of that male itself. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much to Kim, Tom and Tim for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and thanks to everyone at home for listening. Please do get in touch if you have any further questions or comments. And uh, the webinar will be available on the Beef and Lamb YouTube channel along with other webinars. So thanks again and have a good evening, everyone. Good evening. Bye-bye. All right. Cheers.